Good evening and welcome to the Jefferson County Board of Education regular meeting for May 9th, 2017. Um, today, prior to our meeting, we had two work sessions. At 4 o'clock, we had our work session regarding the 2017-18 uh, tentative budget. And at 5.15, we had another work session regarding uh, Vision 2020 Systems Progress Report. And no action was taken. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, have you join us in our traditional moment of silence. Thank you. Next, we would like to have everyone rise and uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. One moment. Let's put this right back and see it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. At this time, I would like to have uh, board member Steph Horn read our vision statement. All Jefferson County public school students graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse shared world. Thank you. At this moment, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Terry Robinson for our recognitions and resolutions. Ms. Robinson. Dr. Harvins, Board Chair Chris Brady, and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education, tonight we begin with the recognition of Fern Creek High School. The school was formally recognized in February as a 2017 DeFore Award recipient at the Summit on Professional Learning Communities at Work. The award recognizes high-performing schools that demonstrate exceptional levels of student achievement. In honor of the school's outstanding achievement, Solution Tree, an educational publisher and professional development provider, presented the school with a check for $25,000. Before Award Committee Chairman Thomas W. Minney said, along with a litany of impressive statistics, the school has expanded access to more rigorous curricula, disrupted inequity, and expanded opportunities for college and career readiness, all while improving their ranking in the state from the 10th to the 87th percentile in academic achievement. Board Chair Chris Brady and Assistant Superintendent Michelle Dillard, please come forward to extend congratulations to Principal Dr. Nathan Meyer, and joining in the recognition is Rebecca Nicholas and Michelle Marilla. We have the honor of recognizing Taylor Clements, a teacher at Atherton High School, Mandy Radnauer, a teacher at Audubon Traditional Elementary School, Kim Joyner, a teacher at No Middle School, and April Moore, a teacher at the Academy of Shawnee for receiving the 2018 Laveline Teacher Achievement Award, which qualified them to compete for the Kentucky Teacher of the Year Award. April is also one of three semifinalists for the Kentucky Middle School Teacher of the Year. On May 16th, the teachers will be recognized with state leaders and violin company officials at the State Capitol Building in Frankfort. Vice Chair, Dr. Lisa Wilner, Board Members Diane Porter and Dr. Chris Kolb, and Assistant Superintendents Michelle Dillard and Brad Weston, please come forward to extend congratulations to these outstanding teachers. Joining in the recognition is Principals Richard Giddy, Tiffany Marshall, Jennifer Cave, and Assistant Principal Julie Chancellor. 
please come forward. <laughs> pleasure of recognizing Catalina Ibarra, who has been a Jefferson County Public School District community partner in education for more than eight years. We have used the services of Poder, formerly known as Radio La Ponderosa, and her services as an advocate for every major JCPS event, which includes parent community meetings, the showcase of schools, and back to school events, as well as for educational segments highlighting our organization. Catalina has dedicated her own time to visit schools, interview parents and school officials, and produce online segments in support of our projects and other activities. She has given all this and more to support our English as a Second Language program and JCPS students and staff. Board Chair Chris Brady and Assistant Superintendent Karen Branham, please come forward to thank Ms. Ibarra for her outstanding commitment and contribution to JCPS students and staff. Joining in the recognition, Alberta Weinberg, ESL and Take Center Specialist, Eli Bersley, ESL Academic Program Consultant, and Ricky Santiago, Programs Manager of Louisville Metro Office for Globalization. so very proud and honored to bestow recognition upon the Jefferson County Board of Education, who was selected as a national finalist for the 2017 Kennedy Center and National School Boards Association Award for its commitment to arts education. The board was applauded for having three arts supervisory staff members, an extensive list of available art courses, a large list of local arts partners in the science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics palette project for four schools. The John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts is the national champion for arts learning and creativity and is committed to increasing opportunities for all people to participate in, learn about, and understand the arts. Dr. Hargens, please come forward to congratulate and thank our board members for their outstanding commitment, efforts, and contribution to our students and staff. Board members, will you please join Dr. Hargens? to be adopted. Superintendent Donna Hargens recommends that the Board of Education adopt a resolution to recognize Heather Wampler, 15th District PTA President, for her outstanding commitment and service to the Jefferson County Public School District, students, staff, and parents. The resolution reads, whereas Heather Wampler has served as president of the 15th District Parent Teacher Association for the past four years, and whereas Heather Wampler's leadership and vision 
as president has led to recognition of 15 district PTA and his local PTAs through outreach with Jefferson County schools, community organizations, legislators, and state and national PTA leaders. And whereas Heather Wampler's determination has expanded opportunities for family involvement and engagement with the new community PTA for Mary Ryan Academy and Liberty High, as well as new PTAs at Alex R. Kennedy Elementary and Norton Commons Elementary. And whereas Heather Wampler's administration advocated for and received remarkable increases in elementary and secondary education funding through participation with rallies for funding for educational activities with the Kentucky PTA, and whereas Heather Wampler proved herself to be a devoted, consistent, knowledgeable, and highly effective advocate for children, families, and public education by building the future one child at a time. And whereas Heather Wampler partnered with Jefferson County Public Schools to conduct coat drives, clothing campaigns, and successful community-wide clothing distributions. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Jefferson County Board of Education hereby recognizes and commends 15th District PTA President Heather Wampler for her commitment, hard work, and dedication on behalf of the children and families of Jefferson County done this 10th day of May 2017 in Jefferson County, Kentucky. Chris Brady, Chairman, Jefferson County Board of Education, Jefferson County uh, Education Resolution. Dr. Harvins and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education, this concludes the recognitions and resolutions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. And just as uh, FYI to everyone, the 15th District PTA will have a, dinner, a banquet dinner tomorrow, and that resolution, resolution will be presented to Ms. Wampler at that time. That's why it has tomorrow's date on it, if you're wondering. So uh, we're very appreciative of everything that the PTA does, and especially uh, Ms. Wampler's dedication to our kids in our district. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, ask, uh, for, is there a motion to receive the recognitions? Motion made by uh, Member Geese, second made by Member Porter. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. As is our custom, well, what I'd like to do now is uh, break for a couple moments and let anyone who needs to go to, I don't know, an art show at their school, um, I'm looking at you, Fern Creek, uh, or anybody else that has would like to take off. Uh, and after you've uh, been recognized here, we certainly appreciate everything that you've done for our, our district and our children and our staff. So thank you very much. And we're going to take a two minute break and then we'll come back. <coughs> Okay, well, everything's settled down. It wasn't quite two minutes, but I'll take it. Um, so 
What I'd like to do now is launch into uh, the rest of our meeting agenda. Before I do so, just to give everyone in the audience a heads up, as well as my fellow board members, uh, currently there is one speaker signed up to speak. Uh, it's been a long time since that ever happened. And uh, also, there um, will be three executive sessions. So, so thank you for commentary. Um, so, moving on to our uh, meeting agenda, um, I would like to ask for a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to approve today's meeting agenda? So moved by Vice Chair Wilner, second by Member Horn. All those in favor? Motion passes. All right, the next item up is approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, is there a motion? Motion made by Member Porter. Is there a second? A second made by Member uh, Kolb. Um, any discussion? Discussion by Member Geese. Is it too late to move our speaker ahead of our superintendent's report? Let's get done with this one and then, and then you can make that motion. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right, regarding this particular, anything else? All right, so let's go ahead and uh, all those in favor of uh, approving the previous meeting's minutes. Motion passes unanimously. At this time, it'll, uh, it will uh, go into the uh, superintendent's report. However, Member Geese, you want to like to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to hear from our public speakers ahead of our superintendent's report. Very well, is there a second? Second made by uh, Member Duncan. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously, so what we're gonna do is at this time, we're going to move our speaker up to this point of the agenda. Uh, our speaker for today will be Rob Matthew. Uh, Mr. Matthew will be speaking about School on Fire. Mr. Matthew, here he comes. As you know, you have uh, three minutes at, uh, to speak. At the two and a half minute mark, you will hear a bell. At three minutes, you'll hear two bells to let you know that your time has elapsed. Okay. Mr. Matthew. Only speaker, no pressure here. Um, here to express my strong concerns about moving forward with the school and fire proposal that's before you tonight. Once again, it's with the Dubois Academy. We are going down a path in which we're spending money looking for people outside to tell us what to do to innovate, ignoring the ideas of the staff we have and not addressing what happens when we do attempt to do something innovative like mopping, and our fear of state metrics gives us no courage to commit and stick with it. Let's consider our partners in this endeavor. First, the Fund for Transforming Education. Quick look at their board of directors shows it's a who's who of privatizing education, including the very forces who pushed through a charter school law that undermines education. Those include Bam Carney, the state rep who sponsored the charter school law that passed this year, Mike Wilson, a state senator and chair of the Senate Education Committee, a strong supporter of the charter law, Janine Hampton, Lieutenant Governor to Matt Bevin, the man who called JCPS a, quote, disaster, Ben Cundiff, a Matt Bevin appointee to the State Board of Education who supports charters and could override JCPS decisions on charters in our district, Billy Harper, a charter school supporter, and I believe a former school board, state school board member, whose ideas are supported by the Bluegrass Institute, an out-of-state funded think tank that has misrepresented data about JCPS for years. Are these the people that we need to be in bed with? Are these, these are the same people that tell us how innovative charters are, then bash us over the head with data when our own efforts to try new things don't produce immediate results. And what exactly is Eminence Independent Schools going to teach us? Looking at their 2015-2016 data, I see they have 800 students. You could essentially fit their district into a JCPS high school. Their minority population is far less than JCPS. What little data they have available due to their small sample size shows African American students underperforming white students by a large margin. Can Eminence really provide us with ideas and vision for new schools that we cannot come up with on our own? And what happens after phase one? Will it be like Dubois Academy, du Bois Academy, where we hire a member of the eminent staff for six figures to share the proprietary information they've gained while being employed by their own district? We're about to enter the wild, wild west of charter schools, where many groups will be looking to hang their own shingle for privatizing education. My fear is that by continually going outside for ideas, JCPS is simply becoming a resume builder for others who care less about the success of our schools than in saying they helped consult or offer services to us. We have thousands of teachers and staff who are bright, talented, and have ideas in a district whose, uh, whose needs are unique to this state, and they are committed to seeing JCPS succeed. Why are we not looking to them for their vision and ideas in creating schools and being bold enough to stand behind them when they do? I ask that you not send us down this path with questionable bedfellows, even if it's currently at zero cost to the district. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our superintendent for uh, Dr. Hargins' superintendent report. Dr. Hargins. Uh, thank you, Chair Brady and members of the board and the opportunity to present the superintendent's report. 
Um, I will just um, remind everybody that today is National Teacher Appreciation Day, and I know this board's goal is to make sure, and my goal is, that teachers are appreciated every day. So we want to thank all the teachers in the system for what you do every day for our students. Okay, here's the board's dashboard. This provides information on staff and student attendance, staff vacancies, and referrals and suspensions. Remember, this dashboard is about time spent on learning, and it's critical to the success of our students. So you can see from the dashboard, we continue to trend the same with average daily attendance for students and for staff average daily attendance. Our behavioral referrals are up, but remember we're recording everything and trying to be proactive, and that really represents a 40% increase in referrals that have resolutions, many different kinds of proactive resolutions. And we are up in uh, suspensions, but only in contrast by 12%. So I want to, and then again, our board can drill down on each of these pages and see more information about each of these items. Um, I'll just remind you that the top three events um, include failure to respond is in every level, and then you can see the resolutions that inclu include <coughs> conferences and um, um, also detention and student conferences and other things, and we appreciate schools that are, are again, being proactive. The Hilliard, Ly Hilliard Lions Excellence Award was on April 27th. Uh, so we want to congratulate all the Hilliard Lions Excellence Award winners and thank Jim Allen again for sponsoring and all the sponsors of this event. And we also want to recognize uh, that we had many educators of color celebrated on Friday evening, April 28th. And this is our own Dr. Marco Munoz being recognized uh, at that celebration. Lincoln Performing Arts School celebrated 50 years, their 50th anniversary on Saturday, April 29th. The highlights of my Derby Week were the Derby, what were the Derby Parade at Price Elementary. There's Price Elementary, and watching our ECE students experience the love of golf at the Don Fightmaster Golf Outing. For over 10 years, the Kentucky PGA Foundation has sponsored the Don Fightmaster Derby Festival Golf Outing for Exceptional Children. This event was held Tuesday, May 2nd at Shawnee Golf Course. Activities included a lunch and awards ceremony featuring local celebrities, including the 2017 Derby Festival Royal Court. And in attendance was Don Fightmaster, who he said this has been going on for 42 years. So uh, it's an amazing event. Uh, as you came into the auditorium this evening, you saw picture scrolling of the students who were recognized last night as the outstanding high school seniors uh, by our mayor at Louisville Metro Hall. And we also want to recognize the sponsors Ford and AT&T. Though uh, 49 seniors were uh, recognized last night and they were all exceptional in some way. So we want to again thank the 15th District PTA President Heather Wampler for her outstanding commitment and service to the district. I look forward to attending the 15th District PTA Annual Awards Banquet, which will be held tomorrow, as Mr. Brady said, May 10th, 6.30 at the Ramada Plaza. I uh, just want to remind you that Dr. Dina Dossett has created a structure for the Student Assignment Committee comprised of internal JCPS members central office and school base to review the student assignment plan for potential changes to be implemented for the 1920 school year. Next year is our last year of grandfathering, so we're on track to review student assignment. And the review process will also include multiple opportunities for community feedback and engagement. So everyone will be involved in this, as well as reach back sessions with other board committees. So we'll stay aligned with that as well. So Chair Brady, I'm recommending for approval the consent agenda later in this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Hargens. At this time, we'll move on to our next item, which, are, which is action items. 
Within action items, there are two sections of, the, of this. There's item 7A, which is the recommendation for approval of job descriptions, and 7B, which is recommendation of approval of organizational charts. Before we launch into that, I wanted to explain why this particular item is an action item. Normally, organizational changes are part of the consent calendar. This particular item, though, is I thought it might be prudent to bring up to the um, action item stage because of the concerns that have been expressed by some regarding the fact that we are in a transitional period right now with leadership and there are organizational changes that are being recommended by those who may not be here to carry them out and also at a time when we have a bigger leadership uh, change that's uh, coming up within the district. Um, I could have and actually originally had this I had asked to push this back to our second meeting in May but it became apparent that there were some items in here that are time sensitive and could negatively impact the first day of school um, so we certainly don't want to do that so therefore rather than pick and choose the sections of this I decided that is not really my role as chairman that is a decision that I think would be better made by the whole board so that's why as an entire unit I brought it up for uh, consideration under action items because if I put it in the consent calendar, we all know it would have been brought down. So um, we have been given homework on this. We've all had a chance to look through the numerous changes on this. These changes are posted on the portals for the public to be able to see. But the reason I'm bringing this up now is that I don't want to have the uh, administration go through another PowerPoint presentation and go slide by slide through every single change. What I'd like to do is create a space here for all of us to be able to ask questions of the various department heads that are making these recommendations and uh, have any concerns that you may have about any of these items um, addressed. I also know that the, I want to thank the administration for going a little bit extra on this and, dis and uh, by providing um, uh, rationale for these changes. Um, that was very helpful to me as a board member to understand these organizational changes. Um, I'd like to see more of that in the future, but I also don't want to add more to your plate. You already have enough to deal with as it is, so, but I do, rec I do recognize that and want to say thank you. So at that time, I want to turn it over to our board to launch into any questions that anyone might have. Don't all start at once. <laughs> all right, Vice Chair Wilner. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, a question about academic services. And Dr. Herring, congratulations to you on your new position. And it's good to see you here tonight. Thank you. Um, so I just want to double check with you. I think I, I think I know the answer, but I don't yes, want to make any assumptions. So when we looked at um, budget allocations on March, back in March, and there were questions raised by several of us, including myself, about um, was there enough being invested in deeper learning? And as I recall, you were saying that um, while more, more resources would be called for down the line, what you were doing was creating a structure for continuity for deeper learning. And so can I just ask if the organizational chart changes you're recommending, is that part of that creating a structure to ensure the continuity of the deeper learning work? Uh, yes, ma'am, and uh, thank you for the question, uh, Board Member Wilner. Uh, let me also reinforce a little bit of what I uh, shared before and also position my um, continuation to support it. Um, as the Board, we have uh, identified our commitment to the work tied to deeper learning. Um, one of the questions was tied to are we requesting enough? The focus was on establishing for the district the opportunity to launch into a department that can help manage, galvanize, and build coherence around not just what deeper learning is, but also to push into our schools. To that end, uh, the org chart that is positioned in this recommendation is first establishing an office that does not exist. It is one of the few requests that is tied to budget, which was approved. Mo other requests might have movement, but this was establishing new um, a, a, an office that would be accountable for what we've identified in Vision 2020. It would have accountability tied to professional learning and deeper learning. There are resource teachers identified tied to being able to have high touch into the schools and into classrooms as we start to build capacity. And the other reason why that's important is because beyond our vision definition of what deeper learning is, our Vision 2020 <coughs> definition, I've also maintained that deeper learning is clearly identified in other areas across the district. 
talent development academies, our literacy work, uh, work tied to math, <coughs> other content areas, even within languages, ESL. So that coherence model that we talked about earlier is critical, but without having an office that governs and is accountable for that, it would hinder the district's ability to continue to push this forward. And finally, going into 17, 18, and then beyond, I positioned at the, at the March board meeting that we should, I would encourage the board to be um, um, in a space of anticipating additional requests down the road. But we wanted to act conservatively yet critically around this first year. Yes, ma'am. Further discussion? Further questions? Member Duncan. Was a, of course, this is overwhelming. When we receive uh, this, it's very difficult to, to go through an organizational chart, even with notes and on it. It's very difficult because we don't know the relationships of, of everybody in there. And you know, my, my question is always, when changes are made like this, and we've got you know, wide scale changes on here, uh, are, are they arrived at collaboratively with the people who are directly involved, or are these arrived at where individuals look at a structure and say, oh, I think this should be, I think we could be more efficient if we do this or this. So, so that, I, I think that's my first question, is how did we arrive at these changes? Um, what, what process did you use? Was that question for me, Board I, Chair Duncan? I, I guess I, so, I, uh, yes, Dr. Herring. I'd be glad to answer that, and I think that is the right question. And the approach for academic services was uh, twofold. Um, so you highlighted two things. Are the individuals who are <coughs> highlighted, are they communicated with? Uh, is that required? Is that a standard practice? It was a standard practice for me as CAO that if an individual was impacted in the recommended move, that there was conversation. So I can stand to say that I have had a conversation either in a collective group or individually with um, people who maintain these roles. I think your greater question was, so how does one come about moving towards the recommendation? So upon um, a hire, uh, months ago, uh, you come in as an administrator, or even if you've been in the seat for some time, looking at where there's an opportunity for greater organizational effectiveness that really ties to the mission of the work. And that was my position stepping into a CAO role that is not unfamiliar, but also looking at where are we moving to meet the goals of the district. In doing so, back in January, I started engaging staff with exploratory conversations. How do we make a decision? So the decisions aren't tied to a person by name, not Lisa Herring, the CAO, but tied to accountability and performance and outcomes, and also culture to help ensure that the work is being done and that it is being managed in the way that the board would expect. Those are the critical pieces to making that decision. For academic services, particularly because they're it is overwhelming, and I appreciate you saying that. I, I don't disagree in taking in the lists, but it is a move to help create the culture of coherence to help guide our work. It is also focused on how do we move with um, strategy towards getting the work done. So those were the key factors here. I don't know if there's something specific to speak to. I don't mind doing that. Um, but those conversations have been ongoing. And again, one of the most important things I can say is that it is not tied to an individual in the sense of by name, but it's tied to organizational effectiveness and our ability to execute the work. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that gives me a, a, a pretty good perspective on it. Um, I was wondering, um, I know, I noticed it says we're moving Title I and II funding under uh, Chief Academic Officer. Is there, uh, what's your thinking there? Well, when you look at what occurs within our title, within our federal funding, um, a great deal of the funds that are within Title II specifically are tied to professional development, teaching and learning, and the opportunity for us to ensure that as CAO, as the CAO, not Lisa Herring, but as a CAO, there is a connectivity not just within academic services, but also across the district around the decisions that we make within that funding model. The Title I uh, combination was also 
pulling together uh, all federal programs to examine here again how do we come to decisions around our uh, funding model to schools disseminating and how do we support them um, one of the examples I gave us uh, was uh, if we were looking at building success in our school models and looking to establish national title one distinguished schools how do we look at our resources to ensure that there's opportunity to do that effectively and one more thing I should say um, board member Duncan also included for academic services in looking at um, what is the most effective model was also looking at districts like ours across the country, reach out to the Council of Greater City Schools to ask for other org charts and to look at org charts across the district from either a departmental level or a district-wide level to particularly districts who have been successful with student achievement. So that was a part of the plan. And if I might just add, that is the process that starts at the individual department level, the division level. Then once that work is done, they come to uh, Tiffany Armour, HR director, and to me, and we go through the process to understand what changes they are requesting. The purpose of that is to make sure it correlates to the other positions that we have within the district and also to ensure the funding is there and that the board has approved the funding if it is new funding position. But also if they are adding a position, uh, let's use for example, uh, maybe a specialist one versus a specialist two, we look at the job descriptions to make sure that it is appropriate and we look to see what other positions throughout the district if they're having the same type of responsibilities to make sure all that uh, correlates and is equitable. Oh. Uh, member, member Duncan, are you finished? Yeah, I, for right now. Okay, Member Porter. Um, Dr. Herring, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on um, your new position in Birmingham and thank you for the work that you've done for the Jefferson County Public Schools. We will miss um, your relationship building. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to say is that when you came to us, the question was what should we do to enforce academic improvement? And when I spoke with you and I spoke with Dr. Hargens about it, I was told that you were spending the time talking to individual staff members uh, to talk about how we could do our work better, how we could actually show growth and development and for that, I commend you, and I commend you for working with staff. I commend you for working with principals. When you said you came here to develop relationships, you have done that. So thank you for the work that you have done. That's very important. Before you can get to the goal, you've got to get people engaged. So, so for that, I thank you for the work that you've done. Um, having said that, I know that um, it's important that we move forward with academic progress for our students. And it's easy to say, well, no, never mind, let's put that on hold, we'll wait. But we've waited, and we have a plan that you have given to us. It's a plan that can be uh, worked on until such time as we get a permanent person in place. And for me, it takes a lot of courage to step out and do what's right. And for me, one of seven, it's important that we never lose focus on what's important, and our students are important. There has been a lot of time put into this, so I, I will say that I support the recommendations that you have made. You did not make them lightly. There was uh, people involvement, and the goal was always students, so that's extremely important for us. To not move forward with the recommendations to me is a disservice to the academic success for the Jefferson County Public Schools. So I thank you for that. Um, the only thing I would ask that you do is to talk to us a little bit because deeper learning is what we're talking about. But would you talk to us a little bit about deeper learning, the Bellman Literacy Project, culture and competence, when you look at what you have designed before us, I would like for the board to hear your thinking about that because it is important for us to understand because sometimes we travel down one road single-handedly not looking at all the dynamics of the entire trip that we're taking so if you could just speak to us about that for a minute I would appreciate it very much I might have another question but that's my first piece was to talk about your involvement 
how you came to these recommended suggestions. And I'm one that's been real anxious about when are we going to get this done. So it's done now. And I thank you for the time that you have spent into it. So if you would just talk to us a little bit about how things will come together. Again, uh, the focus is on academics from the chief academic officer. Dr. Heron. Yes, ma'am. And thank you for your very kind words, uh, Board Member Porter. Um, to jump right into your question around deeper learning, um, reference um, and connection to cultural competency, Bell Bellarmine Literacy Project, as well as a coherence model. I'll take it back to the beginning in terms of my understanding as CAO around the board's commitment to deeper learning. Um, and more specifically around one of the charts that shows where the CAO has a bit more robust portfolio, if you will, to help build a coherence model. Embedded in that are additional um, again, not at cost. This is movement direct reports that leverages the CAO to have the capacity to build the coherence uh, within key departments. Uh, you referenced the Bellman Literacy Project. Even upon arriving, our conversation around the good work that has come out of the Bellman Literacy Project, our goal as a district is to move from, and I think it's okay to say this, I think that Bellman would also agree, from the topic of Bellman Literacy Project to literacy, Jefferson County Public Schools schools, thus the recommendation to embed that within the organizational chart. Because of the work that we've been doing with a cohort of schools for the last several years, and it has continued to build, this is a prime opportunity for the district to seize that and to take ownership and still maintain the partnership that's happening with Bellarmine. And yes, is that deeper learning? Absolutely. Our students' ability to read, to understand the purpose of, the purpose um, and the pleasure of reading and learning the skills, as well as developing our teachers, allows for a different level of engagement with within the classroom, and I think that that is critical. Um, you referenced cultural competency, and one of the things that is incredibly exciting about our focus on deeper learning is that we also are able to embrace deeper learning through the lens of equity and our, our acknowledgement and uh, embrace of the diversity of all of our students. So to that end, there lies also the opportunity to build culturally relevant resources as well as culturally competent teaching, and that is something that we see when we reference back to the org chart within the deeper for learning department resource teachers who would take ownership of that. And I'll pause to say that this is not new. This is also a part of teachers who have surfaced to the top, who have said, whether it was at ESET 2 or have taken the liberty as teacher leaders to say, I love to help lift and lead this work. Here again lies that opportunity. Um, the coherence model goes back to the book study that we were doing at the start of the year within the academic leadership team, the book Coherence. In order for us to do the work, we have to have a system that allows us to not only understand our work, but how it connects to each other. And to, if I can pull from the book, establish strong leadership from the middle, which is our central office, so that we can support schools. So that's deeply rooted within um, the proposal for academic services. It is not tied to any one individual. And here's what I know for certain. There's not a member on the academic services team who does not want the district to be successful. The goal is to help strengthen and put individuals within the wheelhouse to execute the work. That's what we want to see happen. And most importantly, to support schools and to do it in a, at a level of excellence that this board would expect. So building that connectivity is um, through the lens of deeper learning catching various departments, but the CAO has the capacity to ensure that it is occurring, and then building together within the academic leadership team that will emerge from this an ongoing practice of not only executing the work, but being able to report to the board that it's getting done. Thank you. Further discussion? Any other questions? Member Horn. Um, just, um, you know, board work for me is, um, it's just not emergency work. And it, it just always concerns me when I'm given such a large amount of information. I'm told it's an emergency. And, you know, in the midst of what we're going through with the changes in our key leaders in this organization, 
it just makes me really concerned that there's something that I'm missing. So I look at it, I'm looking at this through like the, the eyes of like, is this a something that was a part of the C um, dip? And was it the strategic mission specific? Um, and was it funded in a sense like it was put in the original budget request from the staff? Some of these things definitely were. Um, like, I'll just pull out like Dr. Zeit. She had her requests in. They are reflected in what I see here. Um, it matches the strategy that the, the CDIP lays out and, and what she said she's going to do. Um, Dr. Herring, I see some of the things that we said, the positions that we said in the deeper learning area that are key strategies. Um, and those are reflected like they were pretty identified. But then there are others that this is the time that we're getting the magnifying glass, looking at the budget, looking at the list of what was requested, that I'm just not as clear. Like one example I mentioned is like the transparency of did they really did they really get the school input on this um, custodial supervisors and managers 1.5 million going toward that this org chart that we're getting and these additional um, positions that are being created because I'm hearing like Dr. Razor a lot of schools across the district they were there was supposed to be some principals meeting that was canceled earlier in the year and now they, there was a meetings that occurred on a one-on-one -on -one basis around the um, school-based community but um, you know I'm hearing that that's you know very much concern on that proposal to centralize custodial and they're you know so that's kind of like you know, if you want to talk to that a little bit, I'm just really concerned about, like, that's one issue that it's a, you know, a magnifying glass on what was requested is concerning. Good evening. Uh, hopefully, this should come as no surprise to anyone. The, the work surrounding centralized custodians began well over a year ago. Sometime early in the spring semester of 2016, Rob Tanner and myself talked with assistant superintendents around the theory behind this, just around what do you think this would look like? How do you think the schools would respond to it? And some of the guidance we got was, I think you're gonna have to find out. So over the spring and summer of 2016, Rob Tanner and Kelly Kirk individually met with all but two principals within JCPS. And the reason they didn't meet with two one was because the position was vacant at the time, and the other was there were unavoidable conflicts the two times they had set up to meet with them. From that, eight principals said they could not support this. There was overwhelming trust, overwhelming relief in a lot of situations surrounding this. I, I want to I go over a couple of things. Also, it should come as no surprise because it's been mentioned in at least three presentations, the infrastructure assessment established that our buildings have been habitually under-maintained and the funding of the maintenance of those buildings has been habitually underfunded. So one thing to make clear, first of all, 1.5 million is not in new positions. The new positions are just under $500,000 for the supervisors and then as well as I believe the small amount of support staff that there will be in the in the office for that. The rest of that money is for unmet need of supplies and unmet need of equipment that should have been purchased and should have been supplied all along. Something that came as a surprise to us when we did this modeling because you model things at scale. We couldn't figure out how this wasn't saving us money because all of our estimates were it was going to save us about a million and a half dollars a year. However, the assumption we were making that we didn't catch until later 
is we were assuming that we were fully supporting this effort. One thing that we found out, because we also are centralizing the ordering of products for schools, so there won't be shortages of supplies. That's, not, that's one of the number one complaints we get from schools, as well as our custodial staff. And also, our equipment hasn't been replaced. And that's something that was being done at the school level. When we looked, and this is just one example, when we looked at the amount of furnace filters we should be purchasing in a year, it comes out to around $450,000 and that's on a quarterly replacement schedule, which is best practice. Last year, we purchased around $125,000 worth of furnace filters. <coughs> so one of three things is happening there. And if we just went with a basic across the board, they're only being changed once a year. I'm afraid that it's probably a little worse than that, and some schools are changing on schedule, and others aren't being changed at all. My maintenance staff sometimes goes into buildings to fix broken HVAC systems. And when they get inside, it's not a broken system. It's filters that are years old, that have inches and inches of dust on them. So the idea behind this proposal falls in line directly with everything that Dr. Heron said just a few minutes ago. This is about systemic coherence. This is about people doing the things at which they have strengths in. I'm a former principal. As a principal, I didn't want to worry about making menus, or was the network going to work today, or have they cleaned using the proper products, have they stripped the wax in the correct way. I just wanted to know it was done. My job as a principal, teaching, learning, student success, climate, culture in a building. That's what we want to allow people to do. This is about better service to our schools, but as well as giving that bandwidth and capacity to our school leaders to not have to worry about these things. This is also something that will be a change for schools. It will be a change for our custodians. We have assured our custodians, because here's another concern we have gotten. This is the first step toward outsourcing. This is the first step toward not outsourcing. This is creating quality, creating a standard of excellence. I had my team two years ago do a objective study on outsourcing because every time that we would look into anything, that was a complaint we would get. Oh, they're doing this because they're going to outsource. In a large organization, there are many reasons that you shouldn't outsource. First of all, we've got a lot of old buildings. And you've heard me tell the stories of how our in-house staff knows exactly what needs to be done in this building. You lose all that familiarity, first of all. And you also lose control. There are hidden costs that are never in the fancy presentations. The quality of work is reduced because they don't care how many times they have to come back. It's actually advantageous of them. There's a profit margin always involved. We have no profit margin in operations. And what people have trouble wrapping their head around with an organization of our size, outsourcing in a small organization in a small school district makes sense because you don't have the need to have a full-time fire extinguisher inspector. You don't have the need to have a full-time expert. We have multiples of those who are busy every day. There is no economy of scale savings in outsourcing. So I'll take further questions around there, but there's sort of the, the, the background around it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the teacher in me. I see a hand go up. <laughs> Further questions from anyone? Member Horn. Um, so, Cordelia, on the um, the requests that are that we're being asked to make, this is within the budget cycle. So, like I was saying, that some of them are within the bu budget cycle. They're getting a ma you know magnifying glass. Some of them are just totally on point because they're part of the mission. But then there's some. Are there any in here 
that um, were like basically are outside the budget cycle because we had a list of denied requests that the school based folks and other departments made and took a lot of time to put them together back in December. So are these are there any new funding and things that will cost money in this in these job descriptions or changes, you know, over time? Uh, we have today we did some uh, closer looking at the funding sources and what had been approved uh, on March twenty first. There has been no additional budget request for 17-18 at this point. Of course, there is a list of denials, but there are some changes that we have shared with you and I shared partly at the um, budget work session, where like in academics, the one area that we looked at was eliminating some of the positions that were on here because of the funding to make sure it stayed within line with what you all had approved. Uh, there is a clerk in business services that is going to be funded by the departments within business services through their flex funds. The Title I, because of our concern with the federal funding, we wanted to make sure we're okay and have uh, funds there, so we eliminated those positions as a recommendation at this point. So everything that we have now, it is either has been approved on March 21st, or we have funds within the departments t in order to handle it. Yes, on the academics, the what we just handed to you, we eliminated where we were going to add a secretary to and a specialist. We removed those. We are still going with the four resource teachers and that stays in line with the approval of the $404,000 that you all had approved on March 21st uh, for deeper learning. Member Porter. I'd like to go back, uh, Dr. Razor, and have further discussion about the uh, centralized custodians. Uh, I did ask for a list of schools that do not agree with this, and I have that list, some of which are in my district. Um, a couple of questions. Has the $500,000 been budgeted for? Yes, it was part of the $1.5 million in the budget request for centralized custodians. Okay, but if I heard you correctly, you said part of that would go to supplies, because if I'm looking at the multiple job descriptions that we have before us, there are two job descriptions that are new that would pertain to this. So what is the amount of salaries out of that $500,000 that, that, that you would would take care of what you're requesting. Cordelia could speak to this specifically, but our, our seven supervisors, I believe off the top of my head, their, their salaries as they were budgeted for, we don't know who the people will be in those positions, I believe it was $487,000 and was the... Uh, so job family. So let me be, go back to seven because yes. we're looking at two job descriptions. So from the two job descriptions we're talking about, Seven. There, well, there are uh, there there are seven supervisors and assist and an assistant manager of housekeeping. Mm -hmm. And, and a grade the six and a grade five, so they're going to be roughly between about uh, fifty-five thousand to seventy-five thousand dollars, off the top of my head, are going to be the average somewhere in between those two for those positions. The range. And what else? What other staff do you need to back this up? Uh, the rest of it, and, and a lot of the cost also is offset by the, uh, some of the efficiencies that we're, that we're creating. Okay, so um, we have two job descriptions. You're gonna put seven people, and wh why seven? There will, be, uh, there will be seven zones that are gonna be overseen, and there's, there's also the eighth. The eighth is the assistant manager, seven supervisors, and the assistant manager of housekeeping. Part of, the, part of the reason for adding additional personnel as well is there is no capacity at this current time for this centralized ordering, which is saving us money in, of the price of supplies in scale. Okay, um, 
next question about this. For the schools that have said that they do, want, do not want to embrace this concept, in some of those schools, they take the custodial positions and sell them back to the district to put, it, put additional staff in the school. For example, I might buy half a teacher. Or three. Or whatever. Yeah. So how do we make sure that the schools get what they need as it pertains to staffing if they're not going to have access to the custodial positions? And that is true, I think, in some of the high school situations. So how are we making sure that the schools have exactly what they need? Ms. Porter, I don't know how to answer that question. But here's what I, here's what I do know. We very carefully, as a department, allocate a certain number of custodians to every building to minimally or adequately maintain that building. And when a school then sells back one, two, three, in upwards of six custodians at a high school, there's no way the staff that we have on hand can maintain that building. When the school takes their supply funds and diverts those away from toilet paper and soap and sends those towards something else. I have a school just this week, the, custodian, the plant operator contacted my department and said, we're out of soap and toilet paper and we're out of money. And there's three weeks left. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I feel like just Mike Razor talking, schools should have both. They should have what they need to provide the academic curriculum that they see fit, but that should not fall at the, at the penalty of the upkeep of our buildings, which, as we all know, we're going to need for a long time. So you understand why I have to ask the question, though, because it is a practice that has occurred that uh, custodial, have, custodial staff has been sold back. Am I correct, Cordelia, that someone could turn in a custodial person and use that money for something else within the school? Or I don't think I'm making this up. No. That is correct, yes. They, okay. the SBDM could make that decision, yes. Okay, my other question is, has this concept been piloted anywhere in, in a group of schools? Or are we just gonna, the recommendation is that we just jump into it district-wide um, if, if we pass this? Now, albeit the district I came from was a quarter the size of this, but as a principal, this was the system that I operated in. I had a dotted line to my custodians. They had a supervisor who oversaw them. The, the upsides of that for our principals, the human resources issues go away. The, again, the oversight, the knowledge of it goes away. But also, I was in central office as part of an operations department that oversaw this. There are multiple efficiencies from this. This is also a best practice. If you were, if, if this was a corporation, this would be a best practice of a centralized maintenance department that custodians would be part of, not each office hiring their own. Is there, um, I hate to ask so many questions, but I think that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Okay, if I'm over my time, just say so. Do we have a model of a large district our size? I understand that this is modeled after the district that you came from, but is there a model? Because I know you have visited several districts our size and above, so is this a, have you seen this at work in a large district? I know that my team researched this. I don't know the specific districts they looked at. Part of the, part of the breakout of the number of schools they oversee, I know that they had vetted a lot of this is, again, it's not, it's not necessarily schools, and I don't want to sound just purely operational. It's just industry best practice per square footage, per supervisor, per supply, per number of people that use them. I know this model works, though, and I know that's a, that's a trust thing. I know it works, and I know what we're doing right now doesn't. Well, I guess my concern is for the principals that are not willing, are not anxious, I will say, to embrace the model, I don't think that we're giving them an option. It's an all or nothing situation. And um, I was a principal also. I enjoyed having my staff. 
we had a great relationship. I used Dr. Herring's words because they were the ones that told me most of the time a lot of stuff that I wasn't supposed to know that was going on in the building, as well as keeping the building immaculate because that was the message that they wanted people to see when they walked in the door. So I'm, I'm not saying that this is a bad idea. I'm saying that I'm not sure that, that I'm comfortable that we're at the point to take this system wide as we talk about what we must do in a certain period of time because we were given 30 different job titles, some of which were right now, others may not be right now. So I'm just, I'm not clear and I, I, I'm sorry. And I apologize I, for that. I, w my team has had this ready since October in a, in a finished form. There was some human resources and financing editing that needed to be done. It's been ready for at least a few months to come forward. The decision was made that all organizational charts would come together at the same time. <coughs> However, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to sound harsh at all, eight people out of 150 some, a whole, lot more, a whole lot more people would choose not to have our president right now if, they, if, that, was the, uh, if that was the option bad example. I know. But whatever. But that's uh, one for me. Yeah, well, bad example. So thank you. For, I have one more question about the clerk in the business services office. I understand how it's been paid for, but clerks are sensitive topics because there are other people that need and deserve clerks as well. I know that in our professional development unit that's here at the Van Hoose Education Center, they need a clerk, perhaps. So how do we justify as a board saying it's okay to put a clerk in an office wherever and there are other people that are, that are in need of that and we're not taking care of their need. I'm trying to be responsive to the conversations that people bring to us because it's our responsibility to be equitable with everyone that's trying to do the work. So when I look at the organizational chart for the uh, business services office, I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, abstract to see adding another clerk. I understand that the clerk may not be housed in that office, but how, What's the rationale for that versus bringing equity to some of these other offices where they desperately need a clerk? So that clerk is going to serve as more of a receptionist to the land building, is my understanding, um, if you're speaking to the one specifically on the business services. That's correct. Chart. There is no longer a receptionist at the land building? No. No, actually what they have been doing or attempting to do is having individuals that work in that uh, building kind of rotate in. Um, that we had that happening even at C.B. Young and we, uh, now there is a person that is actually at the front desk which works much uh, better. There's a lot of traffic that comes into the Lamb building because that's where parents come in and so the Culture and Climate Committee actually is the one that uh, recommended that we look into that because it was not being serviced well for parents and others coming in. Okay, so historically I would like to know what happened to the clerk that was there. I was there uh, meeting with Barbara Dempsey. There was a clerk when I entered the building. I worked there for a number of years. There was a clerk there when you entered the building. So I'd just like to know a little bit of history about what happened to that position. And not only is there a clerk when you walk in the front door, there are two or three staff members right there in that front office that have the ability to help out. And one of the things that I've seen in my years here is that people pitch in and rotate around to help out. So I'd like to understand what happened to the clerk position because there was one there for a number of years. Thank you. All right. I want to give someone else a chance before to jump in if they haven't gone yet. Uh, Member Kolb, and then I'll switch it back over to Member Duncan if there's no one else. Um, Dr. Razor, if I could come back to you. What, um, do you have a general sense of what the cost savings on a yearly basis is going to be from this centralization plan? Well, again, uh, Dr. Kolb, you have to take the assumption of what should have been spent. Right. What schools should have been spending. Right. We have, from the centralization of ordering, found there to be annually, and Cordelia would have to help me, was it, was it $90,000 in savings from the, a, a year of, of ordering our supplies and having them directly shipped to our schools as they're needed? The, and again, that right there is estimated on 
sort of what some of our spend has been and what we think it will be. What the centralized ordering is going to allow us to do, though, too, is really move to a just-in-time model that can be very responsive to schools because we can see how much supplies or how, how much supplies they are actually using. And then we can ship as needed to them. The other thing with centralized custodians, along with preventative maintenance crews, which is also part of this presentation or the, this proposal, we are going to begin to start being able to defer maintenance. And I don't know what that cost is because we've never been able to put a number on it before. What I will be able to, to, to do is come back to you again this time next year and say because of preventative maintenance crews, work orders have reduced by X or have not reduced by X. And then because of centralized custodians, we've had, you know, we'll, we'll, my hypothesis is we'll start to notice less runs because of filters, the, the things I had mentioned. Less runs because of equipment breaking down and then things not being done. But I don't have a hard number for you. But like I said, this, this is the most efficient model that we have found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for clarifying about um, w taking into consideration what hasn't been done, because I was taking it for myself, like I, I agree, you know, you can't have furnace filters not being changed. You know, I mean, kids with asthma, kids with allergies, I mean, that has a terrible effect on them, um, among, among other uh, costs of that. So, I, and I understand my, my colleague's concern about um, the principles that, you know, like the money available uh, to have available to sell back these positions. However, I, I think that it, it's a question for the board rather than Dr. Razor what we can do to make sure that um, schools have both, that they're not trying to choose between having soap for kids to wash their hands and not spread flu germs you know, in the winter and having you know, the teachers that they need. So I think, I think that's a question that we have to, we have to address and not, um, not ask Dr. Razor to address. Um, will this, because I've, you know, have heard from some custodians that there are uh, habitual uh, problems with staffing. You know, it, will this help alleviate problems with staffing? We, from, from the fact of there not being custodians there because they have been sold back, yes. Y you've heard me talk before about some of our positions right now and how they are difficult to fill. This will help us because we'll have a synergy of team too where, where we can aid schools in need but from the fact of where one, two, three custodians up to six have been sold back, that will help because we, we notice that as well where many times a school will have an opening and it won't get filled or a school will sell back and they still expect the same level of service and that, you know, again, that's not fair to our employees. Yeah. Um, there are, of course, the uh, custodians are um, represented by a collective bargaining unit. Are there aspects of this plan that we're going to have to bargain in the upcoming negotiations? There are aspects of the language in the contract that we'll have to clean up. Mm -hmm. It may refer to supervisor, and we may need to clean that up. There may also be some areas that the uh, bargaining unit would like to bargain around this new structure, perhaps maybe seniority rights within a building or a zone or transfer rights or, or that, that type of thing. But seeing that we also do have a full contract reopener coming up with SEIU, it's also a really opportune time to do this because we can discuss these things without reopening a contract, you know, mid-tenure. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then final question, or uh, for you is, you know, we've had a lot of conversations as part of the facilities committee and, um, you know, there's no question in my mind that operations is in a very deep hole, uh, not of your own making, but of being habitually underfunded. Do you, do you see this as, I mean, you know, I think, I agree that it, my perspective is that the hole is so deep, you don't even know some of the things you need to know yet because we've just been in this emergency code red mode uh, for so long. Um, do you think this is going to help with that situation? I, I know this is going to help with that situation from the fact that something we have piloted is the blitz crews, our preventative maintenance crews. 
We are getting unbelievable reviews from our schools from when the blitz crews come in because what we're noticing is we're noticing work orders that never even get submitted because they're supposed to be submitted by the housekeeping staff, which is understaffed, which they don't have time to, to turn those in or they aren't even worrying about those things. We're finding things in the building when we make the blitz attack of the maintenance that were housekeeping things that were supposed to be done by the custodial staff but for the aforementioned reasons weren't being done. Ballasts being changed and small repairs that are supposed to be done by the in-house staff. Those will start being taken care of. When I initially presented the infrastructure assessment to the board, I said there were two strategies to attack the problem we have. The first thing and the most important thing is we have to try to immediately begin riding the ship. This is one of those tactics to immediately right the ship. Then what we're working on in the facilities committee and we'll work hand in hand with the student assignment task force, I'm sure, as well as the finance committee, is how do we create a long-term strategy to ensure ourselves from this, hap from this happening again, as well as making sure that every school has a basic level of standard similar to what Ms. Wilner was talking about, Dr. Wilner was talking about with class offerings or teacher positions, every building should probably also have that baseline level that we all build off of. Uh, Member Porter and I have met with you a number of times to talk about facilities specifically around the um, a, a main focus of all of ours is the question of equity. You know, our, our facility, well, we know they're not, but how do we get to a point where our facilities in different parts of the city are uh, more equitable. Um, do you think that this is a, maybe not directly, but will help in the overall facilities, uh, getting our facilities where they need to be, including in terms of equity? It, it's, it's a nice step along the way. We, we piloted the blitz crews in our priority schools because many times those are the schools that have trouble with staffing and also feel uh, feel the direct pressure of this and many times there are schools that do not have uh, as much equity as as they as they should and we we see that as positively impacting it this is not the final answer this this is a part of that but it it definitely can't hurt and would you just describe for us quickly what the blitz crews are what what the blitz crews are is they are made up of our maintenance staff and you have a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, uh, general helpers show up as well, and they come up, they show up at the school, and they say, "What do you want done?" And as long as it's something they can accomplish within a week, they they do it. So, for example, right now our painting schedule in JCPS is about once every 17 years for a school. That's what our that's what our budgeting and manpower get us around to. That's a long time between paint jobs within a school. When the blitz crew's coming, you say we need some stuff painting, painted, so the blitz crew paints a hallway the week they're there in the fall. They come back the next spring, we'd like some more painting done. They paint another hallway, and over the period of two years, your entire building might be repainted. As well as small projects, that don't get attacked as well. So I think, I think the blitz crews from that standpoint are going to be able to help. The other thing that the blitz crews are going to be able to attack is the amount of work orders that are just out there. I've got a presentation in a little bit about being more responsive as a district and to show some of the things that we're doing around that. This is definitely about being more responsive to our schools so everybody is getting toward that equitable level or whatever school you're in, it's clean and it's well maintained. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rizier. I'd like to shift over to um, area five. Do you want me to, okay. Um, this is probably a question for Dr. Zeitz, so I don't know if you could um, get to me. Thank you. Um, the board, you know, as, as you are very well aware, the board made a significant investment in restorative practices um, uh, last year and has the board to my understanding has decided that restorative practices is the overall framework 
um, the board has decided, to my, uh, in my understanding, that restorative practices is the overall framework that we are using to address uh, school culture and climate, um, and including uh, suspensions, referrals, uh, things of that nature. Do you, um, could you just say a little bit about how the organizational chart changes in Area 5 support um, the board's prioritizing of restorative practices as the overall framework? Yes, I think in addition to restorative practices, we're also trying to get some coherence with the positive behavior Correct. interventions and yep. supports work. Um, there was a large commitment to that also and still is in the school climate and transformation grant, which is large, large, large sum of money and driven by federal folks around the practices with PBIS. So our intent was really to try to unify um, those pieces and kind of create again a coherent behavior model. Um, that's something that really is pretty progressive and innovative on a national scale. And those partners that are with us are very excited to do that work. With that said, I thought it was also important, as did the team that we've been working with, um, most of, and, and I say this kind of uh, with some humor, a lot of the decisions around the org chart have taken so long because of the action research behind them. Um, none of my positions right now impact individual people because people weren't in the positions that we've repurposed. Um, and there's no, again, increased cost with what we're doing. We're more just kind of shifting, again, repurposing. Um, to do two things. One is to support the work that we're doing with the behavior supports model. And yes, that is that commitment to trying to make meaning of increased engagement and relationships with the PBIS work um, and try to increase positive culture and relationships and belonging uh, and try to address and help couple with some of our other initiatives with cultural competence, et cetera, with the restorative practices work. Um, but that work was very focused in its scope per the contract that was approved. And so implementing that has you know, created, uh, it had a number, it had a time frame, and it had a plan attached to that $2.4 million that was assigned. So we have a very uh, quality team. In addition, we kind of had two directors in the beginning because the work was not integrated. And so it did not make sense for us moving forward to continue to have two people directing a unified thing, um, which was the decision that was made um, to just create a coordinator of that work um, and someone to lead the resource teachers as a group, because while they might have a background or an expertise initially um, in different pieces of that work, um, all of them have gotten the consultant level training in restorative practices. Um, and all of them are kind of spanned across the grade levels because it was important for us to make sure we had folks that were supporting schools that were at each level and had experience at each level. Um, knowing as a high, former high school principal, I know that for my teachers to give someone some credibility, they're gonna appreciate experience in their context. And so not that they can't support off grade level, but we know how sometimes folks feel, especially maybe in areas where we don't have that authentic engagement that we want quite yet, sending in someone with credibility, at least at their grade level, has helped us get in the door. Uh, and so that would be part of the reasoning behind that shift. And then in addition, we really did need to make some refreshed commitments to student relations and case management of kids, consistency across uh, the way we make decisions about students going in and out of our alternative school programs. Um, there was kind of a rotating staff in that department we have not had. Um, and and I, I, I can't go back and tell you how many years, but it's been a good little time since we've had a full-time staff we probably see if there's one person, maybe late teens of families every day, one person. Um, if there's two, it's twice that, and I have uh, plenty of data to show. Lots of folks going through that department, and when it's a different person every day um, in a rotating scheme, it's really difficult for us to make decisions consistently. It's difficult for us to treat people in a consistent way, and it really doesn't have someone really stopping and looking at students and the reasons that we're doing some of the things that we're doing even with our non-behavior support schools. I'd say finally, one other concern that we had that we're trying to, show, actually there's two, to try to shore up. One is, you'll notice that we've assigned a counselor. And right now, we're kind of trusting the counselors at the sending and sometimes receiving school, mostly the sending school. If there's a change in schedule structure, and again, this applies to any alternative school, not just um, our behavior support schools. We have students that are missing credit opportunities because of wonky timing in the times that they might move in between these particular schools. If we know, for instance, it's a non-behavior support situation and a student just needs to hang in for another few weeks until 
the end of a grading period or we can do the shift to make sure that the work is done and, and the student has credit for that time they've already been in the classroom. We're finding that stuff out later and after the departure and it's making it very difficult for us to recover that. The second piece is schools have overwhelmingly asked for assessments to come back, what we used to call assessments. I'm not planning on calling them that moving forward, but that service to schools was essentially if they had students that they were struggling with or families, and not just for behavioral reasons, sometimes it's attendance, a, a plethora of issues that might again encourage them to have a student explore an alternative choice. Um, those families would come to student relations, they would have a meeting with different types of support staff there. Um, and basically have a crucial conversation around what had been happening with the student, what are your needs, um, what are things that we can do, what's going to happen if we have another conversation like this soon. You're going to potentially be in a position where you don't have choices anymore. Um, and schools, especially our elementary schools, um, who again, their supports have kind of changed, really were interested in that uh, because they felt it was impactful to their families. They felt like if that was something that we could provide as a service, that when families did come and explore kind of if we don't get this taken care of in a, in a more um, you know, responsive way, and sometimes that's us doing more, sometimes that's them doing more, sometimes it's us doing stuff together, um, we're, get, we're not gonna be in a place we wanna be. And so that will also be restored with the new staffing arrangement. Thank you. And what, um, this may not be a question for you actually, but there's a, in one of the, one of the job titles is coordinator to social emotional learning. How does that fit in with RP, PBIS? Do you that, know? That social emotional learning work uh -huh. is directed by Dr. Averett in okay. academic services, and she would be able to address that question probably in a more effective way than I would. Okay. Um, it, it just strikes me as those are very, should be very aligned, um, tasks, social emotional learning and RP PBIS. So I, I mean, you guys know how administration works way better than I do, but uh, is it a concern that being in two different areas will prevent some communication? I think that what we're trying to do, what we continue to do, and again, this has been something that we've collaborated with under the Deeper Learning Initiative, is one, making sure that our administrators understand the value of all of them and the differences in all of them and the overlap or what I call dovetailing in all of them, right? So they're all very important. And when you say them, what do you, you I mean? I mean, so the ones that I typically, I have a big four that you've heard me um, in many of my conversations talk about too are under Dr. Averett's purview, which are trauma-informed care and social emotional learning, restorative practices and positive behavior interventions and supports are in my department. What we've tried to do is make sure you know, principals understand the relevance of all of them and, and, and moving students forward. I think part of our challenge too is maintaining perspective on the investment and the accountability tied to it. Um, I try to make sure folks understand there's a huge commitment obviously to uh, the work with the contract with the IIRP organization and obviously our positive behavior interventions and supports. And I know that we've already collaborated at a principal meeting. Um, I'm sure the collaboration will continue under the Deeper Learning Initiative, um, but any cross-departmental de collaboration is always just something that you have to always be very cognizant of. Yeah. Really, my work is also something that Dr. Marshall and I have discussed, um, is something that also kind of is a crossover. So, um, you know, that always yeah. comes with making sure we can all get to the table and do what we need to do. I think as a board member, as we, um, and it's part of Dr. Hargens' report, you know, every, every time, um, you know, t instructional time missed due to uh, suspensions, referrals, things like that. So it's, it's obviously an issue the board has prioritized. Going forward, one of the things I'm gonna be paying attention to is what, you know, what is the relationship between those pieces and do schools understand that it's not uh, in either or, I mean, clearly they do with RP PBIS because there, there is this integration effort going on, but um, do schools understand that, you know, it's not either trauma-informed care or restorative practices, you know, do, do, is, is that, and I know, I mean, this is kind of a cultural shift for us, so there's always gonna be some um, smoothing out, you know, to do and, and creating common understandings, but that's really important, so that's something that I would ask you to, um, uh, let the board know if there's anything we can do to you know support that smooth, smoothing up uh, yeah i mean i think we I continue to work together i think yeah. you know we've we've worked to try to get some proposals 
um, you know, to be part of the symposium. We're going to be part of the Behavior Institute, um, and we are just excited. But we, you know, we want. What we're really trying to work to make sure too is again, and I've said this, I feel kind of like a broken record. This work is not just for responses after students make a bad choice. So, you know, we know and we have great um, supports that um, we'll continue to share and work with around, again, classroom engagement and pedagogical strategies that are high yield for um, students to have opportunities to respond, students to re receive feedback, all things that all of my partners, but especially those in academic services and instruction, Karen Branham's team, um, work towards. and. It's just trying to maintain focus. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a large commitment. It's a large amount of pressure for our schools that are working on this. We also feel pressure and will continue to work with our schools. Most of that funding is coming from the Climate and Transformation Grant around the Terry Scott work, mm -hmm. classroom management, um, modeling for teachers, de-escalation. In addition, um, we'll be continuing to support schools that were already had an investment in positive behavior interventions and supports. But, you know, we there's a lot to do. Yeah. So we'll just continue to tr to move forward. Well, you won't be alone in being a broken record. I mean, I'm going to be a broken record with you, and I think Dr. Wilmer probably will be too. So um, it's something that the board is going to keep, at least if we have anything to say about it, we're going to keep focused on. So we'll be broken records together. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Answering and the should I stay here for member or chair? Well, okay. I just have to me just yet. So I just right. have one more question about, um, and it concerns the ECE. Yeah. Um, um, slide 91 specifically in the in the um, um, script we were given says due to corrective action it is necessary for our exceptional child education department to locate 3.5 million to support programs in schools I was just wondering if somebody could explain how these org chart changes do that and because I mean to me that's a, that corrective action plan is a big deal I don't want to be under corrective action um, any longer and um, as I looked at the ECE chart, it seemed like things were just being cut, but maybe I'm misunderstanding, or maybe there are being cuts there so that the money can be repurposed elsewhere. Um, we need bigger tables for all the staff. So on the, um, yes, on the org charts, as you know, we are under a um, corrective action plan with our um, students with um, disabilities or African-American students with disabilities for out of school suspensions and in school suspensions. And the consequence is that as an ECE department, we have to um, um, withhold $3.5 million for CEIS. And one way that we did that, we um, looked internally and looked at how we could um, first shift some um, positions to different funds um, and so that was one way that there were no cuts it was just a matter of of shifting to different funding sources and what you see on the org charts are the um, instruct there's some instructional assistant positions that are actually sub positions so we have 15 positions that are for we have students who have need one-on-one -on -one assistance and their assistant is absent then we have people in a pool that we're able to send out to um, perform that duty for the students. And currently there are 15 positions, but about half are vacant. And so it affects about six or seven employees. So they are being moved from the ECE funding um, source and the organizational chart and shifted to the sub-center. And so they're not actually being eliminated, they're just being moved to another, another org chart. So these changes are to free up that 3.5 million. Yes, right? it's to help help with that. Okay, yeah. and that's a and what exactly that 3.5 million is going to go for is probably a separate conversation. Right, that, right. That's yeah. what what we're working on with, and it's okay. it will go towards helping our what we're under the corrective action plan with with our suspensions. Awesome. Thank you, yeah. and thanks for your patience. I am finished. Anyone else? Before Member Duncan, Member Geese, I know you haven't had a chance to chime in. I'm just going to give you an offer. Do you uh, want to? Uh, okay, Member one, Duncan. One of the things I'm curious about, Dr. Harkins, is you mentioned that there are time-sensitive things on this org chart uh, that need to be approved sooner than later. Is there any way that you could have indicated that for us? Because it's very uncomfortable to make all these changes with 
a change in, in leadership, and we're going to have two positions with changes in leadership. And it feels, it, it feels very uncomfortable doing that because we don't know what the next people, how they're going to view these changes, if, if they have all that thought behind them and if it's going to make sense to them and they're going to be able to best utilize it. So is, is there a way that you can identify the, the things that we have to have done that are time sensitive? Um, the um, director of Title I, Title II, right? Um, our director of Title I is retiring. So what you need to do, as you know, Ms. Duncan, in a certified position is post it for 30 days. So if you figure we're mid-May right now, right, posting it for 30 days takes us mid-June. You have a couple of weeks to interview, so you have somebody in place for July 1st. If the person who applies for that position is a school-based person, then there's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a va any vacant position has an impact on schools. One of the resource teachers, if it's a vacant position, if that teacher comes from a school-based staff, they've got to backfill and get a quality candidate for that staff. So there are two types of moves here. One is a vacant position that has to be filled and then there's moving other positions organizationally that Dr. Herring uh, described really well just makes sense. So someone new coming in could move things again. It's those vacant positions that if you don't start that process, we will not have somebody in place for the next school year. Uh, and Dr. Zeitz's charts is she wants to do the interview process and have people placed in those positions. So we have a behavior support system that's ready to roll for the next school year. So that's what the time sensitive issue is. Make sense? Yes. There's yes. the increase in days also to ESL to make sure that we're supporting the intake over the summer. Um, that's really important for those kiddos be in those families because we know that that's when the largest numbers increase. There's an elimination of a position um, also in computer education um, and then the creation of another position that would need to happen before May 15th um, because that is the deadline for uh, making an employee aware. So there are some very sensitive um, situations and then of course speaking to making sure that we have all of our employees in place, especially with that 30-day posting rule is really important to support schools. Yeah, Member Duncan, are you finished? Yeah. Yes. I'm okay, I would, you look like you're contemplating another question, so I wasn't sure. Um, do you have Vice Chair Wilmer? Yeah, I just want to, this whole, the question of um, what's time sensitive, and that was a great way of explaining it, the staffing needs and then the holes that are left of people within the district. I also just want to add that um, <coughs> there was conversation that there were additional org chart changes that were being considered, like for example, putting adult ed under academics. And there were several of those. I could think of several examples if I sit here for a while, but those were all taken off the table. Yes, that's right. Because in, in sort of respect for the transitional period that a new person coming in may want to make additional changes. So what we have before us, and you can confirm this, my understanding is that these really are the critical time sensitive ones to be ready for the next school year. Right, and they're bring, being br brought forward by the divisions and the departments who are closest to the work. Okay, um, let me go, <laughs> and then we'll go. Actually, Member Geese gets to go because he hasn't spoken at all, so you got the floor. Dr. Herring, I'm wondering if you could just take us through a bit of the history of some of the positions and the positions as they've been historically throughout the years and why you see fit in changing those at this particular juncture. Any particular positions, um, Board Member Geese? I don't mind doing that. I know I have a relatively comprehensive list. Do you want me to take you through all of them? In which case, I'm fine with If you could, yes, please. Okay. I'm just turning to the page so I can walk us through it. So it looks like academic services begins on page 51. 
Um, and what you see first there is um, the Chief Academic Officer organizational chart. Um, there are 12 uh, items or changes that are listed there. Uh, going through those 12 is the first, is the Director of Title I, Title II, which is the uh, combination of federal programs. Previously, there was separate Title I Director you asked for a history, so historically, to my knowledge, and I can only go back so far, and also based on conversations and engagement, that the Title I director was a standalone reporting to the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. <coughs> Title II has been housed within CNI as well. In this recommendation, they are put together for federal programs with the intent of also bringing that under the Chief Academic Officer. Um, there has not been, to my knowledge, a long-standing history of a director of literacy, uh, but there is a re recommendation here for that, as I mentioned earlier, based on the Bellman Literacy Project work and our opportunity to take that and make it <laughs> and make it JCPS's own. Um, reading recovery teachers, there are four. Those reading recovery teachers were previously within uh, curriculum management. Um, I've also made those recommendations to pull the reading recovery teachers to report to the director of literacy so that the director of literacy would have additional capacity to expand the work. Um, that was both three and four. The coordinator of professional and deeper learning, so that is not only a title change, but it is also a movement. So historically, the coordinator of Professional learning has reported to uh, the assistant superintendent for CNI. Here again, they're just bringing that work to report directly to the chief academic officer, and deeper learning is a new capacity of work. And so, in an effort to balance the budget request, that position allows for the individual to continue to push professional development, but also take ownership of our expansion of deeper learning. Um, so all items in red, five, six, seven, eight, and nine that are embedded in that include uh, resource teachers, as well as a repurpose, so the four resource teachers um, would be new in this regard, um, a clerk to help support the coordinator and a specialist for professional learning. Here again, the specialist previously within academic services, um, previously with the uh, assistant superintendent for CNI. And then going over to uh, the director of uh, curriculum management which is an important acknowledgement as well because in past history, uh, the title has changed here. So the existing title as of today is Director of Curriculum Management Point 5 and Point 5 Community Engagement. The very strong recommendation was to remove the community engagement component piece so that we can purify curriculum and instruction work. I think that is important. That is our core business for academic services. However, you also see the movement of that director being under the CAO and previously that was in a, from a historical perspective also within the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. And going from there to 12, you will also see the dotted line for um, assistant superintendents for academics, academic achievement. That dotted line still has the maintaining of supervision to the superintendent, but a dotted line to the CAO as that is collaborative work um, as well. Um, and I'll also go, out, go back, go up, this is number 10, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction being changed to only in title academic services primarily because of the movement of curriculum management to the CAO. Now I want to pause and just explain a couple of things, not just on the history of JCPS, but also the recommendation. As a standing CAO and a previous CAO and a former assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction myself, um, I've looked at the organizational effectiveness, effectiveness for us to take our work to the next level. Um, so what you see here is an expansion of the CAO's portfolio. Historically, before I arrived, the CAO also had direct supervision of the achievement area superintendents. Here you see a dotted line. Previously, it was a straight line. That is a significant change. It is also a significant change to move the curriculum management piece to be up under the CAO. And as I turn pages, and I'll unpack that in a moment, there's also been an, a, a, an emphasis on bringing together all curriculum specialists to report to a director. And I'll unpack that a little bit more, and I think as I talk you through it, it may help to understand why the movement is there. So pages 51, 52, and 53, 
And it looks like <laughs> 54 um, are a little bit similar. Cordelia or Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, uh, if I go through it again, it's redundant. I'm trying to move to the unpacking of additional roles. Um, so we're moving from 55. Okay, I sure did. <laughs> okay, those are just arrows. Um, there is a change with the director of Title I. So I mentioned earlier, I'm on page 59 now, Board Member Geese, if we're going through, because from 53 to 59, it's redundant. Um, we also looked at the uh, Title I component specialist, and I think we've handed the change that we recommend there. We want to also take the time in future exploration to look at the capacity of our Title I department. We have a high number of Title I schools, and just like that, I forgot the number. But the intent in the org chart recommendations was to build to the capacity to better serve them and compartmentalize them in different areas, whether that's parent engagement, whether that's is content specific services or other related services under the Title I umbrella that helps us to support our schools. And again, I referenced earlier the title change and I'm hearing myself so I'm going to slow down a little bit so if you have a question you can ask me, I apologize. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, previously that reported to the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. A really important page that I want to take my time with is page 62. And it is a lot of movement that is tied to curriculum management. And I want to continue to balance your question as it relates to current and past practices that I can speak to. And so here again, you will see the change that unpacks in more detail um, the title change for the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction being recommended to be academic services. From the title change, we move down to number two, where I referenced earlier the director uh, for curriculum and community engagement, now just being purified to curriculum management, so that that is the focus of the work. And then um, to number three, um, advanced program, gifted, talented. Uh, I believe that's the title change as well as a resource teacher number four being added to help with capacity of work. Any addition in most cases, board member Geese, is bringing the work to scale, to my knowledge, unless there's an exception, and I'll say it. It is to help build capacity, and it did not previously exist. If there was a previous existence of that, I'll, I'll certainly say that. Now, the um, Director of Curriculum Management, that title was a past title. So I'm taking us back to a past title here again, streamlining the work. In a past title, the Director of Curriculum Management had a larger portfolio of the con content area specialists, all of them. Um, in this recommendation, I'm pushing that back so that the district can continue to be focused and that those individuals can work collaboratively as a team. We have great expertise, great expertise in our content specialists. Content is not just ELA, math, science, social studies, but it's also our fine arts, it's practical living, um, it is music, et cetera. So it's bringing them together to work collaboratively. So in doing that, that's also a piece that you saw in the previous org chart being moved to the CAO as an opportunity to help build that reset because it was a past practice um, and helping to reset focus around how do we continue to move the district forward. It is not by any means anything to um, challenge the work of the assistant superintendent. So the title change was because we moved curriculum management, but the portfolio of the assistant superintendent is quite vast as well, thus academic services. That is a new title that that is. Um, so those numbers 7 through 16 are simply the people who are being moved. None of them are new. They're simply being moved back into curriculum management Think curriculum management, think curriculum standards, think deeper learning, think teacher training, think goal clarity coaches, because I'm going to catch them in just a moment, so that these are the individuals who really have the capacity to have our highest touch to our teachers, to train them, to work together, to focus on the lens of equity, for a cultural competency to help take the work to the next level, but for them to work together. And that's what the reset was about in this recommendation. Um, 
I think that that captures, ah, um, there was one other position on there, the Academic Program Consultant 3 ESL, I believe that's Dr. Beardsley. So um, what you will see as a change as well is previously that was a direct report to the Director of Curriculum Management that will report to the Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services very large portfolio of work and a lot of budget changes tied to that as our population is growing and as our data showed us early on back in October, it's, an, it's one of our gap groups that we need to focus on our service uh, capacity. That's good, okay. To the clean page, which is. Okay, and do you know that page number? Keep going. Perfect. So then we're at page 70. That's what it looks like. Thank you. Oh, high five from right here, uh, Tiffany. So what you see on page 70, and I'll again speak to changes, um, would be um, the a Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services then taking on or continuing um, the Director for Library Media Services our director for early childhood, very large portfolio of work, thinks our early childhood centers, uh, site administrators, and a cohort of children to whom our work is critical. And now the ESL um, uh, coordination, the director for computer education, our advanced programs, um, a gifted and talented coordinator who now will also have a resource teacher for extended work. And then, why is that coordinator six throwing me off? And then. Thank you, I'm sorry, Kat. Um, and magnets, <laughs> and, and, and magnet schools. Um, that, the assistant superintendent for academic services is a change in title and the removal or the repositioning of curriculum management. That would be different. That is not a past piece, but because the past piece also included the movement um, and of co content specialists, program, content area specialists, um, I thought it was important that the chief <coughs> academic officer helped to galvanize and focus that work going into 1718 um, and beyond. And I don't think that was it. Um, so, there, so the curriculum of management additions are movements. Those are not new hires. Those are not new people. It goes back to what I shared earlier, bringing them all together so that they can uh, collaborate and build the work. But there is an additional piece there, which is a representation of 26 goal clarity coaches. Every school within the district does have a goal clarity coach that is site-based, and then there are 26 that also help to uh, serve our schools. In an effort to continue to build the capacity to serve, we thought it important to help them to connect with the content area specialists. They, many of them have content area expertise. So again, when we think about size and scale of our teaching staff and wanting to make sure that our delivery, our service delivery model for them is strong, that's what this reorganization is tied to in this regard. And in past roles, um, if you want to speak to history, I think the age of having our Gold Clarity coaches is at about five years, so that's before me, might be a bit more than that. Um, is, is that's about right? So I think that here again, building coherence around that work is critical. Um, thank you. I think I have one more. We're pushing on to page 78. So thank you. That's the clean version of that change um, or regarding the director of curriculum management. Very clean version that, that shows that as well. Yes, sir. I suppose my main question is, and this may be a loaded question, may not be a loaded question. Okay. Um, but how does your new plan with these changes, how does this increase account, excuse me, <coughs> your new plan uh, with the org charts, how does this seek to address accountability within the district? And do, they, do the new people that you'd be bringing in or, or with the changes, do they know where the accountability lies and ultimately where does accountability lie within the system? Well, that's a three-part question. Um, it is loaded, that's okay. To the extent to which I can answer, I will. Um, and I want to kind of go back. I think I could say that it is my plan, Dr. Geese, from well, Major Dr. Geese, Board Member Geese, I'll speak in, a, in the future. Um, but um, I mentioned earlier 
that a great deal of conversation with the individuals that are identified, not by name, but by title for this conversation. I've had conversations with. Um, would every single individual be agreeable with the plan? Perhaps not, not every single, but they are aware of the change. The goal tied to the recommendation, which is why I'm saying the conversations really pulls me. It's not my plan, it is the plan for the district. Mm -hmm. um, from, a, from an accountability piece, when we look at um, the mastery of standards for our children, the importance for deep engagement in the classroom, and if I'm a classroom teacher, which I was and would like to think I'll always be, you don't just, as we know, walk in, but there's critical need for training and coaching throughout. Mm -hmm. This is where that training and coaching comes as it relates to the accountability model. And although I still maintain that our children are not just test and achievement, but when you ask about accountability, we kind of sort to that. Mm -hmm. We know that if we don't have strong systems in place with the right training, whether it's research-based practices or how do we engage from a relationship standpoint, if we don't have those practices in place and we're not supporting teachers, we're not gonna move our children. And so that's how I see the accountability model for this plan being the academic services plan. Um, it is a loaded question. Is that going to be the only lever to move? Not at all. But is it one of the most important ones? Absolutely. So I say that to you with a great deal of confidence. I say that to you also referencing earlier that we've got some solid people in the organization. We do. The movement is around collaboration and focus, whether it's grade level uh, specific or content area specific. And I thank you very much for your answer. And I have just one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, my last question deals with the size of this bureaucracy. Yes, sir. Uh, obviously, it takes a long time for each of us to read through um, and even for our employees to read through and truly get a sense on that accountability ladder that we mm -hmm. just discussed. Do you see your uh, improvements here as I'm, I'm sure you see them as improvements, but do you see them as helping to streamline the JCPS bureaucracy? <laughs> Or do you think there are more improvements that could be made to reduce and streamline that bureaucracy? <laughs> well, I think that it is a start to help streamline the work that every board member expects us to execute in the organization. I think it's a start. That question of could it be more, that's a longer conversation. Um, and do I have the capacity to identify more? Probably not alone. Um, I think there's always an opportunity for more. But what I have tried to recommend, I, I appreciate that you use the word streamline because that really has been the goal. And if there is some discomfort um, from colleagues, some of that is moving us out of what we might have been doing um, in past practice. This is practice tied to children, practice tied to outcomes, and practice tied to learning. And so I hope that it, the, the, the intent is that it will do just that, but it will not be the only thing that will address the bureaucracy that you asked about. I think there's more to it than our org charts. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for being very patient and answering my questions. Yes, sir. All right, um, I wanna make a couple comments, but we're not, Believe it or not, we're not shutting down conversation yet. Uh, so other people still have opportunities to ask questions, but I just want to be able to get my two cents in before we, you know, get cut off in time and things Mine of that nature. i directly to Dr. Heron, what she uh, just said. Okay, well, and that's the case, then by all means, go ahead. Okay. Member um, Porter. Thank you for that. Um, that's the first one we've had all night where we went through every page, every chart. Obviously, you spent a lot of time on this and effort to get it to where it is. What we have p typically done prior to you coming is we have a work session where we go through these. So, so we did not have that opportunity, so we received it this way. But clearly, clearly, it's clear to me that you have spent a lot of time with staff to get it to where it needs to be. So I thank you for that. Um, outstanding job, not a question, just a comment. Thank you. Okay. so. What my questions are, um, just a couple. Uh, first of all, I do want to ask uh, about a position within the communications department. Now, I know that 
Uh, Allison Martin is not here right now. I don't know if this is a question that can be asked of anyone up there or, or Ms. Breslin would like to answer this question. But my understanding is that within the organizational chart, there is a, a position being asked for for a marketing manager. Um, I have a question about that because about a year or so ago, we let a, fo a few folks go from communications, but now we're bringing people back. So I'm confused as to what's going on with that position. Um, because it seemed like we were streamlining a year ago, but now we're not. So I'd like to get some context around that. This position is very different um, than the positions that were eliminated from that department a year ago. Um, this position, um, and if you look at the performance responsibilities, is specific to marketing. Um, so they are going to be working uh, very closely with the people already in the department and obviously with Allison and her team, but um, working with digital media, um, working with the de other departments also, but what we often say is that we do not have, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's the very first one there, assist communications and college and career readiness in the development and implementation of JCPS brand strategy and career talent academies. Um, but also is working um, within uh, the digital uh, marketing and research. So it's not at all the positions that were in the department before. Okay, it just seems like there's some folks that were, that were in that, those positions that certainly have done elements of that. So that's how I can my, my No, and question. I can assure you, I mean, okay. my role as HR director, we certainly have to okay. pay very close attention to that. So. The uh, other question I have in regards to these, um, these positions, and actually we'll, we'll kind of come to directly at academic services. Um, I don't doubt that some of these changes need to happen, and I certainly understand that there is a time sensitivity to some of these, so I get that totally. Mine's more of a practical question in the fact that we're in the process of not having a CAO, and we're in the process of having a new superintendent here in the near future, uh, possibly an interim, uh, hopefully an interim, so that's our plan. Uh, definitely an interim, sorry, so we're still in that process. I don't want to give any false doubt out there, just my word usage. But my concern is that we have a number of folks that are actually being realigned to report directly to the CAO. Without a CAO, then all that goes directly to the superintendent. Superintendent generally has a whole lot on their plate. An interim superintendent who's being brought in to learn the district has even more on their plate. Um, and even though there might be someone who might be a part of the district or, come, or had previous experience within our district, there's still going to be quite a bit of learning that has to go on with that. My concern is that though, because of the structure that's happening and just the timing of it, not necessarily the structure that's being placed, in, that's being uh, recommended here, it's more of a question of timing. Um, I have a concern about there being, one, a lot of folks that don't have any direct supervision. And two, I have a, a big concern about whoever the interim uh, might be, unless they were to get a, in fairly short order, an interim CAO, which is what I suggest, or at least what I, I say suggest, suspect would happen. Then, but that's a, that's a decision by the interim that none of us can make, right? So that, that leads a possibility of there being a whole lot going on here that no one is really in control of. So that's my biggest concern about that. You seem to have already thought of this. I'm sure this, is, this question has already been brought to you by existing staff or current staff. My question to you is what's your response to that? Anyone? Uh, let, me give, let, let me give it a try, okay? Uh, the the uh, changes don't take effect until July 1st. So the most important thing is to get those vacant positions filled. So that gives us an opportunity to post the uh, CAO position. I think Mr. Brady, you're right for an interim superintendent to possibly look at an interim CAO. In the worst case scenario, we get close to July 1st and there isn't um, an interim CAO, right? You can temporarily, everyone will has to have a supervisor. You can temporarily assign a supervisor until all that's worked out. So 
what Dr. Herring is proposing is structurally very strong to have odor, oversight and coherence about the different pieces that have to work in academic services. Uh, so those other things could be worked out. So, but we have talked about everything's a domino effect, but it doesn't go in effect to July 1st. So, um, but like I said, worst case scenario, that people would be, I agree, the interim superintendent can have not have that many direct reports. They would have to be reassigned to other staff members if there's not an interim CAO. But we've talked about that. We're starting a school year. It makes sense to put an interim CAO in there. But again, an interim superintendent would decide that ultimately. Okay, so that leads to another question right now that I haven't had a clear answer on. So Dr. Herring, I apologize, I'm putting you on the spot. But when is your last day with us at JCPS? We have not identified that day just yet. Um, okay. But it will be my goal to identify that for you before the end of this week, Chair Brady. But okay. I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you honestly. Um, we haven't identified that day yet. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out at what point, you know, when this, you know, I go, well, you know, at what point we're going to be without this to be able to get this type of a line. So I'm, sure I'm sure. trying to go, trying to get an idea of what that process is going to be. And in response to your statement, which I don't have, uh, you are, you're, everything you said was correct. So I understand that. Um, as it relates to other matters tied to me, I think that would be a conversation that I would entertain absent of the mic, but I don't have the date for you today. Okay. Yes, sir. All in, right. in administrator recruitment and development, we have a list of strong retired administrators, recent assistant superintendents. I think that we could have conversations with um, who would be strong candidates for interim chief academic officer as well. Okay. So we have had those conversations. All right. Um, so, you know, I think to what Miss uh, or Member Horn had talked about earlier, you know, there's a whole lot, the devil's in the details. Uh, I had concerns coming into this that, you know, well, I had concerns at first about the entire process of, you know, making changes so close to the end. I'd heard through the grapevine that this was coming. Um, I didn't know if what form this was actually going to take place. Um, when this first came before me, my first gut reaction was, okay, there's time, you know, there's a whole lot of changes. I want the board to be able to take more time with this. That's why I said I was trying to put this off, you know, two more weeks. Um, as we've all discovered tonight, there are certain things that have to happen by a particular deadline. I found it a bit disconcerting that things were grouped together and all came to us at once. So that's something I would prefer to not happen in the future. But the, the you know, it, for me sta sitting here, listening to all the concerns that were expressed by my fellow colleagues and your all's answer to them, um, I understand the urgency of this. So I, I, I commend you guys on at least selling me on that. Um, I structurally have concerns, but those are structural concerns. Um, that's not concerns with what the recommendation is. So those are two separate things. I don't want those things to get conflated. Um, so that being said, you know, I think that I understand uh, everything that's been done here. So at this point, I know that there, um, that kind of concludes my questions. I've gotten answers to that. So. Uh, to my colleagues, I know that there, think there were a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, did anybody have any other concerns they want to express at this time? Member Porter. Um, because of the number of organizational charts that we're being asked to vote on, are we making one vote as all or none, or can we vote some of these separately? Because there have been some specific questions mm -hmm. about some of them. So what is the process? The process is whatever board members make a, rec or make a motion to do. Um, now. The question then becomes actually one of order. Uh, at this point on the agenda, we have job descriptions first, which is item 7A, and 7B is organizational chart uh, approval. So we could, and I'm, uh, yeah, so we could approve the uh, job descriptions, but I don't know if those job descriptions really go anywhere without actually approving the chart. Uh, or the organizational chart. So my my initial thought is that the organizational chart needs to go be approved before the job descriptions are approved. That's my guess. Uh, hang on. So my but the other thing is that regarding if you're looking at doing one department or one section or even getting down into the nitty gritty of each individual job, board members can make those recommendations and make those motions for anything. There is nothing in here that says this is all or nothing. I personally think. 
coming into this that I had a question as to, you know, maybe we can section some things out. But as I said, listening to everyone's explanation of this and seeing that there are certain efficiencies to be had, there are certain things that are certainly going to impact the first day of school, there are certain deadlines that we need to act on. Um, I've been kind of sold on all that. So uh, before I turn it over to you, Member Horn had a question, or, did, or you, do, do you have a continuation of your question, uh, Member Porter? Did you have a continuation of your question? I guess uh, more detail is needed for some of these particular jobs because for certified positions, they post for 30 days. If I'm posting for a clerk position, how many days do they have to post? We typically post for one to two weeks. Okay, and for these new job titles for uh, housekeeping, how long do they have to post? Usually for administrative level or mid-level management, it's going to be about two weeks, but it can be a week. Okay, so the critical positions are the certified positions because they have to post for 30 days. Am That's I correct. correct. How many days before school opens? 98. How many? 98. Uh, the one thing that I would say, though, is there will probably be rolling domino effects with every job description tonight that has been that has been proposed. So even though it will be a two week or a one week, then it'll be a two week or a one week, then it'll be a two week or a one week. I think there are questions about all or nothing, and I think that we've had enough questions that there may be a request from some board members to vote some things independently and if it's not voted tonight if it could perhaps be voted at the next board meeting which is in two weeks my concern is academic performance for the students my other issue that I've discussed previously is that we have waited for the academic performance and even you Dr. Razor said that you've had your materials together for some time but time is of the essence with the 98 days for school to open and we've cleared up the fact that in the event that when we are making replacements of staff, that there would be people in charge to, that would be in charge for folks to report to. I guess it makes me a little anxious with 98 days before school to open. If we are thoroughly committed to deeper learning, academic progress, to put that on hold when time has been spent to develop the, the plan, the charts, and all of that, to not move on that, again, you know, I'm going to use this word that I heard on TV Sunday night, courageous. We have to be courageous if we are concerned about opening school at a level to present information to our students, to our parents. It doesn't matter who is in the box. My customer are the students and the staff of the Jefferson County Public Schools. And I mean, I cannot say that enough that who our customer is. The work goes on, and we have 98 days before school starts. Thank you. All right, um, Member Horn, then Member Cole, then Vice Chair Wilmer. I would just suggest that if somebody wants to pull out, like I want to pull out, for example, the PM1 property management org chart, and I would say in the corresponding job descriptions. So that is how I will pull it out. That would be a suggestion. You and would so need to make a motion. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And so I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to pull out and put on hold um, the PM1 property management org chart and corresponding job descriptions. When you say put on hold, do you mean table to the next meeting or mm -hmm. do you want or an indefinite hold or just can a, you, be cl can you provide clarity? Just indefinitely, you know what I mean? Not vote today on that, to pull so it, to pull it. So an indefinite hold. Is there mm -hmm. a second? No, I'll second it. There's a second, uh, second by Member Duncan. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion fails. Uh, abstain? Okay, one abstention. Uh, Member Cole. Um, I think we need to let our staff get on with their work. 98 days, I think, sounds like a long time, but when you're planning for 150 schools on 100,000 kids, it's really not that much time. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we adopt both action items as presented, uh, action items A and B, recommendation for approval of job descriptions and recommendation for approval of organizational charts. Second made by Vice Chair Wilner. All those in favor? Is there a question? It, well, we can have time for discussion, so you're correct. Member Porter. So my question is, if we wanted to pull 
down, for example, the clerk position in the business office? Can we pull that down and vote on that separately? I don't see the sense of urgency that would, for that That would job. be a motion that you can make. So do I make that? You make it now. Okay, I would like to make the motion that the clerk position for the business, chief business officer position be pulled down and come back to the board potentially in, in two weeks, but to not vote on that tonight because I'm not clear on the sense of urgency. I've requested additional information that would give us time to get that additional information, so I'm requesting that we not vote on that particular position tonight. All right, just for clarification, so I can shorten that, your motion is to pull down the clerk position for the CBO uh, to, be, uh, to be voted upon at our, at our next meeting. Correct, and that would okay. that also is impacted by an org chart. There's an org chart on there for that. Right, the org, org chart and the job description. That's correct. All right, is there a second? Okay. Second made by uh, Member Duncan. All those in favor? Okay, I'll, we'll move that. So that, is that was an amendment. To that was an amendment to yes, that was an amendment. So I should say a motion to amend, but I'm. I, this is, I'm not going to stand on, on all that. So we functionally, we understand what's going on. So my motion's been Your motion, moved and seconded. Your motion has been moved and seconded. It's been amended. Amended. And okay. now uh, your motion still stands. So now we're going to, uh, if there's any, if there's no other further discussion, we're going to move uh, to a vote for your, the amendment, <laughs> amended uh, motion that uh, has already been motioned and seconded. So unless there's any further discussion. Okay. So. Call for a vote. All those in favor of adopting uh, the org chart changes and the job descriptions minus the uh, clerk position under the CBO's uh, office and for which has been pulled for further to, uh, consideration for our next meeting. All those in favor? All opposed? All right. It's six to one. Motion passes. All right. So at this time, we are going to move on from our action items. That concludes our action items. So thank you very much. And yeah, I know that was a long, that was a lot of discussion. Um, this is why I was not part of the consent calendar. So moving on, we're going to move to informational items. Um, I'll state that I'm going to do one more, inf uh, we'll go to our next item, which is going to be uh, item 8A. And depending on when this ends, uh, I might ask for a break after this next session. I'm trying to get us, I know we lose signal at 930. So I want to be able to try and get those that are listening at home a full time, a, a full meeting. And then once that happens, then I'll probably end up asking for a short break for everyone to kind of stretch and use the facilities that need it. So at this time, I'm going to move the item, uh, informational items, which is item eight. And we're going to start with item 8A which is an update to Vision 2020 goal communications indicators on issue resolution and response time. Uh, member, uh, Dr. Hargens, would you like to introduce this? We'll give it right over to Dr. Razor. It's Thank an update. You. Good evening again. Although this uh, falls under communication, what we're going to talk about tonight is responsiveness. Some of it is very specific because it's mentioned specifically in the strategic plan the call center, a single ticketing system, but also part of responsiveness is strategic alignment and process improvement. What we're talking about here again is coherent systems. We're talking about making sure that we don't have systems that are fighting themselves. So information that you've seen before, but I do want to give you updates on, and I will be very brief given the time. The call center we established in August with about 30 days lead time. The thing about the call center that I want to talk about is this idea of the minimum viable product, the MVP approach. This is an approach that's used by lots of startups. It's how Uber started. Basically, what's the purpose of what you want to accomplish? And what is the minimum resources, minimum manpower you need to get that off the ground? And given the time frame as well as the resources we had at our disposal, we said, what do we need for the call center? We need phones, we need computers, we need desks, and we need a room. So that's how we formed it, and we've let it work like a startup. It looks probably like a lot of startups did, but it's achieving its goal. Right now, we're averaging about 500 calls a day, and as we showed you when we gave the presentation on it, there are periods of time in the fall during open enrollment when 
calls about benefits spike. At the beginning of the year, it was calls about buses, and then throughout the spring, calls about student assignment and student placement. But we, are, we have achieved our goal of a single number for JCPS calls to be routed through and then tying directly in to our single ticketing system, we're able to track those calls and what they're about. Right now, we are scaling our ticketing system, and I know you're not going to be able to see very much of this, but I just wanted to give you more of an idea of what my people can see. There's not specific information on these next few slides that are important to you. But basically, we're able to catalog everything. And we're able now to start deriving analytics from this so we can continue to be more responsive. So here's what you can see from one of our IT teams. This is just a snapshot in time. The average hours to reserve a ticket or to, to resolve a ticket. Now, those may look like some long hour times, but the team that you're looking at here for the most part is our development team. So these are developing software programs. These are providing uh, bridges between two different software programs. But then the other thing that we're able to do is you're able to drive deep down in and you're able to see what people in IT are best at what tasks. So we're able to align human capital with the tasks that they're best at. So if it only takes somebody 40 hours to develop a product where another person in IT, it might take 80, you put the person on that task who it only takes 40 hours and put the other person in their strong suit. And finally, the one thing also that we get too is we get feedback. This is how we're doing. Every time a ticket is completed in the land desk, there's random generation of a survey that goes out where the service provided is given a one to five ranking. So you can see how you're doing how your customer feels like you're doing. Are we being more responsive to our customers? So as I said, right now, this is in the call center. This is in IT. We are poised to roll this out eventually across all departments. So then, too, similar to Louisville Metro's 311 system, when you call in, you'll be given a ticket number and then you can track back and see what the resolution of your ticket is as an internal customer. And if someone were to call 313 help and say, hey, I called about a bus issue, 313 help would be able to pull that up and reference it and help out that constituent in a much more knowledgeable way. This slide and the next few slides really have to do with the systems culture that we're creating. We, re we reorganized the maintenance department and the, really what was called the old facilities department in the fall of 2015. And in December 2015, a new director was hired, Rob Tanner, transferred into a position here. And our goal was to be customer responsive. When that team was taken over and the reorganization happened, we had over a thousand work orders in maintenance over 90 days old. Last week there were nine. That, that, is, that is phenomenal. The way that was accomplished, though, isn't phenomenal. The way it was accomplished was by being intentional. Where does our customer feel the pain the most? And it's they're waiting on something. So we had those, that kind of intentionality to concentrate on them. By the end of the summer, I predict 90-day work orders will go away, and 60-day 60, 60 work orders are down under 100 now. So our goal will be, with the preventative maintenance crews, to have work orders at a 30-day turnaround. And that still sounds like a long time, but when you think some of these work orders are remove the tree or build a fence or things that take, prior, that take planning prior to doing them, it is really phenomenal. We've cut our mowing cycle almost in half. And again, we did this by being intentional. One of the things that we had done in the past is we hire lots of temporary help in the summer to mow. I mean, we have 
150 plus sites. That takes a lot of time to get around to. Well, in the past, our alignment was not strategic. We would send temporary crews out. And as I referenced earlier, some of the ills of outsourcing is, first of all, they don't have any pride in necessarily doing that work. But there wasn't a whole lot of oversight by us. So what we did was we aligned where we had one member of our staff be the foreman for every temporary crew. The other thing we did, too, is we created mozones, slow mozones, and no mozones. The areas around buildings get mowed very frequently. A big field out behind the building that no one's using over the summer gets mowed every other time. And then we've identified places on our property that we never should have been mowing in the first place, that along with a partnership with Trees Louisville, we're turning into urban reforestation zones on our campuses. And the tree canopy in Louisville, I know this isn't a talk about that, but it's an unbelievable way to aid in that. In-house warranty work. We also, re we also reorganized the IT department to be more responsive last year and made all of our techs, whether they were an electronic maintenance tech, a copy machine tech, or an IT tech, one universal field tech. And that allowed us for cross-training and additional training of our staff. One of the benefits of that is now for several of our providers, we have been certified to do in-house warranty work. So what took three to five weeks to get technology back in the, kids of hand, back in the hands of kids is now only taking three to five days on average. So there's direct responsiveness to our customers, the school and the student. We also, because of this increased capacity of all the techs being cross-trained, we were able to, again, something we'd stopped doing, I think, 10, 20 years ago, we do in-house data wiring for our schools now. So if schools need a data drop in a classroom or in an office, they can get that within three to five days now, where again, it was three to five weeks. A un an unintended positive <coughs> consequence of this work are A, it's about half the cost to the schools, and B, the money can simply be transferred from one account to another account when the work is done instead of our purchasing department having to create purchase orders and paper trails to use outside vendors. This one doesn't sound sexy at all. But in March, we started recycling our technology in a different way. With the new privacy laws, we were shredding every hard drive of our surplus technology. That was a laborious process, but it had to be done. We identified a vendor and then through a, and then through a, through a quoting process, now have a vendor that will pay us for our recycled technology and we make more on what they pay us for the recycling than we did at auction. Almost four or five times more per computer. As an added benefit of this, because of the profit we're making, we're also able to take the old square cube televisions, which are now obsolete, off of school's hands. We have thousands of those across the district. And it was costing, costing us substantial amounts of money. We had to ask for a budget request this year to get them out of schools, because schools don't want them there anymore. They, they, they have no use for them. So, Again, we got more money, we're getting rid of obsolete inventory, it's much faster disposal. TVs now don't cost us anything, but again, importantly, because of responsiveness, techs aren't shredding hard drives now, they're out fixing technology for schools. I'm really proud of my team with this. In the last three years, we've increased the number of students eating lunch in our cafeterias by over 7,000 kids. Breakfast has increased by almost 6,000 kids. I mean, that's a direct impact on our families. And along with this too, with responsiveness, one of the things tonight also coming up is our ability to expand free lunch 
in more buildings for every kid, as well as eliminating the reduced price lunches whatsoever. And then again, around systems thinking, we've had a real process improvement focus in operations, and my team has done a really good job of taking that out to the departments they oversee. I think all of you would agree, you see all the graphics, the things you, the, the backdrop there, the sign behind you, the sign out front, materials production does fantastic work. This year, they doubled almost the amount of jobs they did. Because of looking at the process they followed, because of looking what their core business was, we were able to print all of the district-wide assessments all year long for all of the schools. Because of that, our schools didn't get sent a file and say, print this, and for days on end, in some cases, the, the school copy machine, which I know you've all heard about, the school copy machine is sitting there just chunking out thousands of pages of paper. We have industrial machines. They can do this work in days for the entire district. So we've been able to do that as well. Those are just a few of the highlights, but what I want to talk about more than the what is the how. How have we been able to do that? The first thing is we've built relationships and trust within our department. And because we have it within our department, we've had schools and other departments that learn that they can trust us. There's been real systemic thinking, and that systemic thinking has been around what's our purpose? That clarity of purpose, why are we existing? Something that my team has really embraced as well around this responsiveness is, a, is an idea of simplification. Do less better. What are you here to do? Let's focus on doing that. Do less better. Have a continuous improvement innovation culture mindset. We've also practiced lean management. Uh, if you remember back, many of the reorganizations that we have proposed within operations have created a really lean management structure and a lot of direct touch between supervisor and boots on the ground employee, where there's a real understanding of what's going on, a flattening of the organization. We've also created auto autonomy up and down the organization. Steve Jobs has a quote that I love, and it says, basically, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people what to do. We hire smart people, and then they tell us what to do. We've done in operations. And because of that, we have gotten a culture of high expectations. We, we've got a group of people who are willing to start these MVP projects, as well as pivot on something if it's not working, We've gotten that stakeholder involvement. And then finally, I think what you've been able to see too is the way that you can leverage technology at a district systemic level to impact both internal and external responsiveness. And then finally, what, what we've really tried to embrace is that smarter, not harder. Let, let's, let's be productive, not just active. And that's taken time. That's, that's taken about five years to get uh, even people within my own team to stay, well, no, you're, you're not too busy. You're working too hard. Any questions? Colleagues, any, any questions regarding this presentation? No? OK. Well, I'll just I'll say for myself, uh, Member Horn and I were, uh, as you know, we've talked about it before, um, chairing the uh, infrastructure improvement side of our Vision 2020 uh, strategic plan, which is that third section that's in green in the back. And a lot of that had to deal with switching over to a customer service mindset and also putting in some of these metrics. Um, one of the things I was concerned about on the front end was that we had this 313 help system, which is awesome that we got it going, but we didn't have a ticketing system for it because I know that's one of the things that helps with Metro call. Um, I was a little concerned about that because I thought, you know, I always want to start everything right now. So we eased into it, and now we're going to be applying what we already have of Landex into 313 Help. So I think that's going to be a really big win for our, uh, our community 
um, because I know that one of the complaints that we had prior to implementing 313 Help is that no one ever got back with me, and that's because there were 37 points of entry, and you get 37 different answers, and there was really no way of necessarily defined way of having someone track something and call you back. This will give us the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, this is a process. It takes time. So I want to commend our op staff for being able to do all that. Uh, I think that we're going to be, you know, especially some of our data nerds here, uh, will certainly appreciate being able to see the analytics that come from that. And um, so we look forward to it. And one of the things that I would appreciate is getting a more of a better handle on knowing the season for certain things. Right, so okay, we know we're going to get more calls to Bus Finder at the beginning of the year. We know we're go as board members, we're going to get constituents talking to us about student assignment in March because that's when those notifications come out. Those things we already know, but how can we better prepare for that? And so it's a smoother transition for everyone. So thank you. With that, that uh, we're done with our first uh, information item, and we have lost our cable feed, which tells me that it's time for a break. So what I'd like to do is take a recess for about 10 minutes. Everyone has a chance to stretch, use the restroom if you need to. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to be in recess until uh, 9.45. That gives us 11 minutes. Thank you. 
you're going to get the way the optics are the. Yeah. Uh -huh.